So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have Charles Evans with us, the president of the Chicago Fed. Hi Charles, good to have you with us. Marcus, thanks for thanks for inviting me. It's a real, real honor. Great, and uh, we're trying out a new format today, just uh, some immersion view. And uh, so we're sitting essentially virtually in the same room or even though we are miles apart uh, in physically. So we will talk today about uh, monetary policy in a low R star world, and uh, we will get all the insights from uh, the expertise coming out of Chicago and more generally out of the uh, board as well. So let me start with the current situation and the current situation essentially is um, very much, you know, everybody is worried that what is the current inflation we are, we are experiencing? Is it a temporary spike or is it something lasting? And perhaps you can talk a little bit about that. You know, is it because of the huge stimulus as Larry Summers explained, or is it because of supply shortages or they're different? And, you know, what's your favorite indicator to figure out whether it's really temporary or lasting? And how much do you trust uh, in market signals? Do you have any? Any take on that, on how do you see that? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And um, let me start off with the first one, and uh, you know, we get a little back and forth. I think, um, I mean, clearly the um, you know increase in prices, um, you know, recently has been um, you know eye popping. Um, you know, very large um, increases, relative price increases. Really, I mean, it's not not across the board price increases, but we've seen uh, an awful lot of. Uh, uh, goods, um, you know, increase uh, very strongly. Um, you know, used car price increases were one that obviously got uh, my attention, everybody's attention. When uh, one month they increased ten percent, ten percent, just in one month. That's not annualized. That's ten percent. And the next month they went up seven percent. And the next month they went up ten percent. We've seen a lot of supply shortages, uh, bottlenecks. Uh, supply chains are really uh, fragmented, and in, uh, in many cases. And, you know, I will have to admit that this is something that I didn't anticipate. Um, and, you know, so we've definitely been, been thinking about this carefully. And, you know, there's, there's no way to uh, sugarcoat this. This is finding its way into higher prices that people are paying. And, um, you know, it's very difficult for them, um, you know, uh, within their, you know, current income means, even though the economy is doing well and people are coming back on the job, these, you know, definitely are, um, you know, affecting their ability to go out and buy certain things that they really care about, you know, at the moment. But I would say that the supply shocks have been uh, a big part of this. And so, you know, we learned, I think the first time I sort of mentioned this was in January about chip shortages, semiconductors, uh, they hit the auto manufacturers very uh, quickly. There are a number of reasons for this um, that range from the fact that when you know, the economy, you know, closed down, you know, in the spring of 2020, auto manufacturers sort of put off the, you know, delivery of these chips. And then the chip manufacturers decided to uh, pivot to uh, consumer electronics more quickly than people were expecting. And then there are issues with uh, the, the vintages of those chips and cars and, and things like that. So just the normal um, type of supply responses and, uh, you know, there have been delays. Um, there's been a number of, um, you know, delayed maintenance too, you know, we, we sort of shut down the economy. Um, I know that some large manufacturing plants, steel in particular, but others, it's like when you're nervous about how things are going to proceed coming back, I mean, they delayed maintenance and that sort of added to some of the supply chain uh, ramp up issues. Of course, now steel is running all out and uh, steel prices are uh, $1,800 a ton for uh, benchmark uh, steel logistics. Containers are in the wrong place around the world because of uh, different shipping patterns and delays there and just bringing goods over across the ocean on ships, getting them unloaded in ports, finding drivers to you know, drive them to the right place. So it's, it's almost like, I mean, it's almost like a national hurricane you know, hit the country. Normally hurricanes are in one particular place and when there's you know, challenges with uh, replacing you know, lumber and things like that. It comes from another part of the country, but it hit nationwide. And, um, you know, it's really had this big effect. So we've seen large relative price increases. And in terms of the inflation discussion, the question is going to be, 
I mean, you don't expect uh, steel prices to stay at 1800 where it used to be that $600 was very good price uh, for, from a producer uh, standpoint. So, um, you know, we expect that to come down. Lumber has come down and, and things like that. Um, but they could stay at high levels. Now, the tricky thing is inflation is the raw increase in prices. And so even if sort of not so good case, they stay at high levels, but they stop going up, you're going to see less impact on inflation, you know, per se. That gets you into discussions about higher price levels. You know, the FOMC didn't uh, decide to undertake price level targeting. We'll come back to that later, I think. Um, and so I think there's very good reason to think that the, you know, burst of relative price increases finding their way into broad inflation indices is going to give way to um, lower inflation numbers. How that's going to work its way into expectations, though, is going to be, you know, a big part of the question. So in your, your favorite indicator would be, you know, there is a danger that it might become a lasting phenomenon because initially in the beginning yeah. of the year, everybody said it's just for a few months, but it, now the months are dragging on and dragging on and supply shortages are there. Yeah. But is there any particular number indicator would say that's what we should look at, uh, which would be a good indicator whether it's persistent or not? I, let me come to that in a second. You just you know, sort of mentioned it's 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 taking longer than anybody expected. And I went back and reviewed some earlier comments that I made back in January when we first started, you know, thinking about the semiconductor uh, chip shortage. And I was seeing reports where people were thinking, oh, this is going to last three to six months. Well, you know, now it's they're thinking 18 months from from that time frame and, and maybe longer. And so it's just we're learning more about what it takes to rebuild, restart an economy from um you know, from being very cold. Um, there probably people have written about this. I haven't uh, uh, seen it myself or looked for it, but I mean, it's almost like after a war, World War II, where you're kind of redeploying uh, from different sectors, you know, production and satisfying consumer demand in ways that you weren't able to do uh, before. And that had relative price um, changes. I mean, in terms of favorite indicators, I think um, for, the, for the way that I'm thinking about this, oddly, it's not my usual take on this. I think looking at actual prices is actually you know, important. Seeing if used car prices sort of start coming down, how quickly do they round trip? More things going to stay higher. I think a lot of uh, travel airline prices have risen, uh, but they're not necessarily higher than where they were before uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So rising back to where they were, say February 2020, or taking off more uh, than that. Actually looking at the components of the price indexes is going to be pretty important. But inflation expectations measures are obviously very important. How wage demands and increases find their way into higher costs for businesses and will they be passed on, um, you know, and, and how they'll... So we see actually wage increasing much more than anticipated as well. So that's more a sign that it's, it's more a lasting effect or it's also desired effect that wages increases to some extent. Because it can be more lasting. increase for the last decades. I mean, it, it could be more lasting. It could be a one-time shift. Uh, we've seen labor share of income decline over a long period of time, and so one might guess that it wouldn't be, you know, too unexpected for it to turn around and start increasing a little bit. I think you've still got the issue about, um, you know, certain types of jobs being favored, whether it's because of uh, high levels of skills, uh, it's difficult to penetrate entry into those because of the skill levels required and so the supply might be restrained there whether or not you're able to work remotely as you and i are you know i mean you know we're over a thousand miles away from each other and it looks like we're very close and uh, it's a very good uh, uh technology i think the other thing that's actually kind of interesting too i think um you know we're learning that technology can can do more for us i think a lot of people have always thought or known that we could use this technology, but you know, a lot of businesses, think about all the workers who kind of said, you know, I think I could work from home more, you know, or at least some days, you know, why do I have to do a commute in large metropolitan areas where it's, you know, an hour in and an hour back, uh, you know, and I think sometimes a flippant answer would be, oh, it just can't be done. Oh, the technology, oh, it's too hard. And all then we had to do it and we've lifted the veil from that. And it's like, we can do this. Um, and in fact, actually going back to the office is presenting additional challenges because we're going to need more bandwidth than we had, you know, in our own office. I think that's pretty common because we didn't have 
you know, continuous video experiences. We actually sort of shut down people live streaming things when we had a big event. Um, and, and so technology is uncovering, um, you know, new changes. But so, so some, some workers have these skills and they can work remotely. Others have to be up close, personal, um, you know, in the facility. And so th those are more challenged. You can imagine a compensating differential for that, perhaps making up for uh, a different labor market. You know, now it's uh, compensating for, for health risks and, and other things. And, and there's a lot of fatigue too, so. I see, so you, you think because of that, looking at wages straight might not be such a good signal either because there's, it's noised up by a lot of other working from home phenomena and I, I think wages will be very important to look at. Don't get me wrong. And I just, I just think it'll be complicated. And, you know, that's what economists do well, right? Looking through um, data, doing controls, uh, looking at different uh, regions and uh, disparities and, you know, trying to figure out what underlying trends are. I think, you know, looking for a, a change in, um, you know, bargaining power between firms versus uh, workers, um, you know, firms for, just in, from business reports talking uh, to businesses, you know, over many years when there have been uh, labor shortages during the recoveries, even going back to the 90s, you know, the, the economic response would be to business people, if you're having trouble, you know, finding workers, why don't you raise wages? And the business response is usually, no, you don't understand it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, we're able to do, eventually it does work that way. Um, and, and so now we're really finding that, you know, I think in a big way, is it going to be a change in wage expectation formation and it'll be continually increasing for, for monetary policy and what we're talking about is we want to separate out the one time, you know, level readjustment effect from the ongoing year after year, sort of across the board and how it gets into inflation, because at that point, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the level of accommodation that monetary policy must be providing that would be um, helping. Uh, facilitate that, whether for good or for, you know, excess. So some people argue that when you look at the wage increases, they're all more temporary in nature, like bonus payments or sign-up bonuses, rather than the base wage rate going up. That would suggest more it's a temporary thing, but other signs are showing it's, it's more long-lasting. So do you look at these components of wages, or do you think it goes too detailed uh, in this? And then the other question I have, do you have any financial signals, financial market signals where we say, oh, this is really informative? Uh, so we absolutely do look at the, you know, composition of compensation um, increases and whether or not it's, um, you know, um, permanent increases in wage rates, so-called permanent, because people don't like to reduce uh, wages. Uh, it's very, you know, unpopular. Uh, businesses definitely started off uh, with the one-time signing bonuses. Um, Depending on how you structure that, you hear reports of uh, somebody signing on to a, uh, you know, a firm, maybe as a driver, getting a thousand dollar or much more signing bonus, staying for whatever short period of time is necessary, and moving across the street and picking up another signing bonus. Eventually, if you find yourself in this type of situation, I think you're going to have to offer something more long lasting in order to, um, you know, build trust and, um, um, you know, um, uh, more loyalty to a particular firm. We look at all of those things. I would say that it's giving way from those one-time level effects to more uh, permanent wage increases. I talked to a lot of businesses who were kind of saying, yeah, I'm increasing wages and it might be to a level that, you know, in six months or a year, we're gonna all sort of agree is higher than uh, what we think we would have paid if we hadn't gone this route, but they could well have to traverse that. Um, you know, and that could find its way into a uh, cost uh, more permanently. Now you asked about market, um, indicators, and that's a very important part. We look at uh, financial market indicators of inflation. Those tend to be compensation. So we have to, we want to tease out inflation expectations. You have to worry that in sort of the tips uh, markets and um, other financial uh, rates that you've got uh, risk premium, term premium, as you know so well. Um, we all use a variety of, um, you know, state-of-the-art finance models, I guess, uh, affine term structure models. We look at different survey measures of inflation expectations. Um, um, there are different ways that you might do that. We have our own models at the Chicago Fed. Some try to forecast inflation within the model itself. Others look at inflation expectations as a survey and try to treat that as a noisy indicator. Um, it's really difficult to get changes in inflation expectations is my take from that style of analysis, it, it changes in the indicators are often, quite a lot of it is a, is a term premium, risk premium 
type of thing. And so, um, and it could be that that's because inflation experience over the last quite a long period of time has been um, um, not volatile. Uh, it's been low. We've had trouble getting inflation up. And so, uh, you know, the balance of the data that's being looked at, you know, ends up showing that inflation expectations continue to be, you know, at two or below. I do worry that they're, you know, kind of below um, that. And the market um, often gets it wrong too, because a lot of behavioral traders and psychological elements in the marketplace as well. I mean, you know, there's always uncertainty and, you know, people make bets that they don't always turn out. I'm not aware that there's a particular bias and, you know, always getting it wrong. If I knew somebody was always wrong, I'd like to know that because mm -hmm. I could, you know, go the other way. It's hard to be wrong all the time, actually, right? That, that's the intriguing part um, about that. You know, in our earlier conversation, you asked about the, um, index of common inflation expectations um, that the Board of Governors has put together. And um, I think that's a pretty interesting, um, you know, new index. It's um, it's kind of complicated, um, you know, as I, as I think about it more. more. It, it, so it, it puts together um, a number of um, inflation expectations measures, whether from the survey of professional forecasters or from uh, the Michigan Survey of Consumers, from the Conference Board, uh, business reports, also from uh, financial markets tips, and um, you know, and things like that. It then mixes in like short-term one-year expectations with longer-term expectations, and then sort of the forward, you know, five-year five-year forward type of that. And then it puts it all together, and then it tries to extract a dynamic factor, which is you know a very useful um, you know way to sort of summarize data and. Um, you know, I kind of look at that and kind of go, it's still a challenge to know exactly what we're getting out of that. Um, it would, you know, there's an entire discussion about which uh, maturity inflation expectations we should be thinking about in modeling and, and things like that. But I, you know, I think that's a very useful, um, you know, kind of measure. I think it's only been around a little while and we have to sort of think about how to calibrate it. But, you know, you put all these things together and I think they're still indicating that, uh, Inflation expectations are, are not getting out of hand, um, and I think they're. I still wonder if they're fully consistent with two percent inflation on average over time. So, I mean, it, this index essentially puts, as you said, puts all the different inflation expectations together. But if you unpack it, and do you think it's most importantly that you have the expectations of the bond traders or the expectations of the households, or actually of the firms? And I think, as you mentioned, you talked to a lot of uh, CEOs and. And they're actually setting the prices. So shouldn't we focus on this, the inflation expectations of the firms? And many of them told you, or at least in the media, they say, oh, prices will go up and I set higher prices. So out of these three groups, which ones would you, would you say you would combine all of them together? That's more informative or would say bond traders, they might have it wrong, but the firms, that's perhaps my bias, uh, who set the prices. Or is it the, the households, you know, who, are driven more by past in experiences in inflation and certain salient products that they say, okay, that will affect the wage bargaining. And that's really driving things. So if you, you know, look yeah. across the board, what or you say, you have, you have to look at all of them. My uns unsatisfactory answer to you is that I have to look at all of them because, you know, I, I recognize that each of them has uh, different strengths and different weaknesses, right? So, you know, survey of, uh, you know, consumers, um, and it asks, what do you think about inflation? Maybe it points them to CPI, but sometimes it's just inflation. And since we, you know, are focused on PCE, we also always have to kind of go as, you know, there's a, there's sort of a wedge between those two. And, you know, how does that play out? Then, you know, from years ago, when i um, talking with Michael Bryan from the, the Cleveland Fed, and then he moved to the Atlanta Fed, he, he'd done a lot of work with those. And, I guess the people at Michigan are well aware of this, you know, there's a wide disparity of responses. And, you know, some of the respondents are like, you know, eight, 10% inflation, it's just very high. And you end up top coding, you know, a number of these responses, and you have to use, you know, fancy techniques, which you can do, and they get, you know, good, you know, information out of that. And what's really useful is sort of how things change from, you know, month to month or quarter to quarter or things like that, as opposed to the level. So once you get your mind around the idea, you're looking for changes more than just the level. I think the tips data and compensation is the same way. It's very difficult to look at that and know, you know, if the five-year, five-year forward, as you tease it out, comes out at like 2.3, is that 
2.3% inflation, or, I mean, it, it's the fact that maybe it went up and it's been down for a while that's most informative. So directional issues are that. As I talk to business people, you're never quite sure why they're able to raise prices. It's a lot easier to raise prices when there's identifiable factor like a supply increase, supply chain, chips are in, I mean, you, you can pass those along pretty easily, but in the relationship kinds of uh, pricing business that they, that they have with so many clients, it's like, mm, you know, they're going to get, um, you know, whacked if they raise prices indiscriminately. So it, it, it's hard to tease out exactly, you know, without knowing their marketing strategy and things like that. So you kind of put it all together to try to get a feel for where inflation's going. Plus you kind of take note of the fact that we've underrun our 2% inflation objective almost ever since we announced it in 2012. And the times that we kind of got up to 2%, we kind of quickly retreated because something happened. Um, so if I listen between the lines, you're saying the disagreement among people what inflations will be is also an important indicator in a sense. Is it worrying that if there's a lot of disagreement as right now that the inflation anchor is getting weaker or would it say, you know, that the inflation disagreement is not a good signal about the strength of the inflation anchor? That's a good question. Um, you know, the disagreement, you know, so I guess part of it would be why, why do you see disagreement and, um, you know, what is it that people in the Michigan survey are looking at? So again, disagreement over time. So there are well-known biases like, um, you know, at least when I was talking to Michael Bryan years ago, I think, um, you know, women respondents, had, you know, saw higher inflation than uh, male uh, respondents, but um, uh, you might see level differences in prices, but going ahead, you shouldn't really see that. So, you know, there, there are things, there are disagreements there, but you know, when the disagreements seem to be indicative of, mm, I'm not so sure if monetary policy is focused on the right objective. Um, that would be very important and insightful, right? Whenever, you know, a lot of what I worry about is um, with the effective lower bound closer than, um, you know, a greater risk than most people really um, under uh, appreciate. Um, you know, I think we have to always be trying hard to get to 2% and make sure we're, you know, living up to our 2% objective. And so if people think that we're not, you know, willing to, to get it to 2% and stay at 2% or above 2% to average it, then, then that's a problem. Now, of course, if they think that, you know, we've lost our eye on inflation and, you know, you see 3.5% inflation right now, and if you're worried that it's going to continue, then that's disconcerting. We probably need to be patient and see how this plays out a little bit longer before we form you know, a firm judgment um, on that. But, you know, those are important um, indicators too. And so even though I have certain views on um, the difficulty of getting inflation up, I take seriously, you know, people on the other side or other commentaries that I get, which, you know, sort of challenge that view. And I think we all have to be open-minded about this, especially during the current period. So talking about the inflation anchor, so perhaps we move on to the next uh, topic, monetary theory in a sense, and there's this sense out there that the Phillips curve is very flat uh, at the moment, and it's flat as long as the anchor is holding. And I wanted to get your sense, what's your take on the Phillips curve? You know, we, we talked a lot about our star, we will talk about our star later on, but do you believe in the Phillips curve? There's some academics who don't believe in the Phillips curve anymore. What's your sense and how important is it in policymaking this, you know, frame to have the Phillips curve and, and how much does it depend on the anchor and the flatness and the anchor? And the next item I would like to raise as well, if you look at the strategic review, the NIRO doesn't play so much of a role anymore. And you redefine unemployment. Uh, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit uh, on these things, on, on, on all the elements of, of the Phillips curve, essentially the unemployment component and the anchor. Yeah, okay, okay, great. Let me start off with the first one and um... You, you can sort of decide when it's time to move on to the, the other elements there. But the, so, so the Phillips curve, um, yeah, no, I'm mindful of, you know, talking with a number of economists and others who kind of go, eh, I don't use Phillips curve or I, I don't believe in the Phillips curve. And my question is always, okay, what is your inflation mechanism? Um, you know, for anybody who, you know, sort of says, well, we've got a lot of demand out there right now, and we do. Um, and, you know, it's possible that it can outstrip supply 
And when you take into account the fact that supply has not responded in the way that we thought, we've got supply problems, that's even more you know, problematic. And so you know, we've seen inflation go up. Question is, what's the mechanism you have in mind that determines inflation over the next two years, three years? Um, you know, for the next year, I think looking at prices tells you a lot, but you know, what's your mechanism? Um, if you don't like the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve, I, I kind of think, I think Janet Yellen, um, you know, described, um, you know, pretty mainstream inflation mechanism, which has got a Phillips curve in it, where it's kind of like, we know that inflation has been inertial, um, you know, over a long period of time. So you're doing some kind of forecasting, you're going to put some inflation lags in there, you've got some transformation that you think uh, captures either stickiness or mean reversion or something like that, but lags are going to be important in that. It's also going to be things that happen exogenously that are just outside of what your model is going to pick up very easily, like oil shocks in the 70s, or in this case, chip shortages or, or things like that, dollar shocks, um, you know, things like that. So you've got exogenous shocks, you've got some idiosyncratic shocks and some price components probably too. Um, then you've got slack. Um, you got the Phillips curve component, which is which is sort of like, well, you know, or um, you know, workers in, um, you know, you know, big demand. And so they're demanding more wages and that's uh, being uh, pushed upon for costs and prices or, or the other way around, things like that. Do, do firms have more market power somehow too? That could find its way into that. Then inflation expectations, you would expect that forward looking. You'd be kind of have your eye on where things are going in the future, not just the lags, but you don't want to be completely backward looking adaptive. You want to have some forward looking part. And then you've got errors. So, I mean, that, that mechanism has a lot of different components and the Phillips curve is certainly one of them. So if somebody says, I don't blame in the Phillips curve, are they telling me that they've got a zero weight on you know, that resource slack? What are the other things that they're thinking about? Or is it some totally different? Is it a, a fiscal theory of the price level kind nice. of uh, model where they've also got, you know, fiscal theory of the price level focuses more on the price level, it's that, price increases after that, where you got to add some kind of thoughtfulness about what monetary policy is doing. It seems to me as I vaguely um, 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 understand and appreciate that. But, but I think all those factors are in work. And, and my key point is, I think you need an inflation uh, mechanism. And um, you know, this, is what, this is what I've got. And I'm, I'm all ears for other people who have different thoughts. But some people argue that Phillips curve is fairly flat, so we can actually expand and bring the unemployment down further and further without inflation dangers. But there might be the anchor breaking and then the Phillips curve jumps or something right. like that. Right. Uh, that's, but so there was an interesting question uh, from Andres and from the audience. He asks, you know, coming back to the previous point a little bit, do you look at uh, you know like new modern data, high frequency data when you look at price changes, which comes from fintech companies or some tech companies looking on goods data day to day or whatever? Is there some new developments at the Chicago Fed going on where you know we look at you know different data because now with COVID we now register through the mobile phone things differently. Is there anything like I mean, this it, going on? I mean, it is the case that, um, you know, with, with, with the COVID pandemic and uh, the fact that things were happening very quickly, um, you know, everybody looked more at um, real-time data, mobility data, um, you know, things like that. Um, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that our folks and others have been looking at additional measures of pricing and, and things like that. But, you know, pricing, there's always been an intense desire to among financial market participants, it's the case that, you know, they want to get the inflation, they want to have a good forecast of what the CPI is going to be, you know, uh, when it comes out and, and the PCE, and they actually, you know, place a lot of, you know, market trades on that, kind of wonder about that, but, um, and so they spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the components are, and they must use um, the kind of data that you're, you're, you're talking about. I, I would say that, you um, you know, we probably have some awareness of that, but we don't, I, I don't follow that really, really carefully, especially since I think that inflation, it's over a longer period of time that you see, you know, sort of the trend. So, so the interesting thing about the, well, you know, it, it, if it's the Phillips curve and, 
maybe you drive unemployment low because you know un unemployment below what most people's assessment of the Nehru is, we haven't seen a lot of inflation. Um, certainly not since, you know, I kind of agree with Jeremy Rudd when he kind of says 1991 or two, something happened and, um, you know, inflation has, you know, really not gone up a lot since then. And there seems to be a slightly different process there. In that time, I think we've seen, you know, inflation, I'm sorry, unemployment go uh, pretty low at times, and we didn't necessarily see an outsized amount of inflation. But you're right. What if it breaks, right? What if the anchor you know, kind of breaks? And, you know, this gets us into work mostly using a linear type of model. This breaks is about a nonlinear kind of model. Um, it's always hard to forecast those. I always enjoy reading people's takes on that, but the transition from one you know, regime to another or how it is, is, is really kind of hard. And um, you know, I think at the end of it, we kind of know that we're in a new regime when we see higher inflation for a long enough period of time, it would start um, it's just getting there at, at the board at the Chicago Fed that the unemployment, the way we measure it, we have to rethink it a little bit because labor market participation is changing also because of COVID potentially changing, as you mentioned earlier, or is, is there some rethinking on that dimension? Well, I think it's very important to have a good assessment of what the labor market situation is, um, perhaps for a different reason than, than what you're pointing at right now directly, but I mean, I you know we have a dual mandate, and uh, we're supposed to, you know, provide monetary and financial conditions to support maximum, you know, employment in our new long run framework. We kind of point out that it should be inclusive, you know, employment, and so that's a, a broader array of indicators of how uh, labor market vibrancy is uh, proceeding for for more uh, uh, segments of the uh, of the labor force, and I think that's extremely important. I think at the end of the, I think the dual mandate has served us very well because it, it allows us more quickly to make good arguments for why we're adjusting monetary policy when we're going into a recession, um, unemployment is going up and we haven't seen inflation move you know, yet, but we know something's coming and you can kind of point to something that is actually moving as opposed to a forecast that I think inflation is gonna be going down and we need to be more accommodative. So I think that's served us well. And I think we've learned the lessons of the natural rate um, that, you know, there are limits to, but, but, but here's the thing. If you try to push too hard and you look at inflation, is inflation, you know, going up? Is it, is it above your target? And what if it's not? If it's not, you probably don't have the right measure of the natural rate. And so putting work into thinking about you know, how to measure that's important, but it could be the case that inflation is not that responsive to the labor market, which then makes you wonder, well, what is your inflation mechanism? What is it? Is it expectation? Does it have this nonlinear component? I mean, I, that is a very interesting question. I think, um, I mean, it was recently in Jeremy Rudd's paper where he, you know, talked about uh, some measure of the stochastic trend in inflation and you know how it's you know been trending down, and now it's been pretty flat ever since that you know early '90s. And it's kind of like, you know, if that were to go up, that would be sort of a break in the anchor, perhaps like what you're talking about. But you know, it's it's long term, and is it going to move very quick? You get you get into the details of how you estimate it and what's really at work. I think there's a lot of fruitful work to to be done further on that. I agree, but we have also a different fiscal response these days. I guess that probably makes the whole world look different. Oh, uh, um, that's yes, that's that's right. So your inflation expect. mechanism process is more complicated. Whether or not it's that add-on exogenous factor that I mentioned for uh, what I'll call the Ellen inflation model, or you know, or not. That's um, yeah, no, that, that, that's noteworthy. So talking more about the inflation anchor, let's perhaps move to the next big element. So one of the review was to really measure unemployment uh, slightly differently. The other thing is, was this huge new framework the Fed implemented, the flexible average inflation targeting. I was wondering whether we can talk about this a little bit. And, yeah. and one question is, you know, you take the average of inflation uh, or average over how many periods and it was not really specified. Uh, Jim Bullard mentioned, I think, uh, a few days ago in some uh, presentation, it's five years. But is it not specified because it has to stay flexible? Uh, is this part of the flexibility? 
And then the question is also, is the flexible average inflation targeting, does it, is it asymmetric? Is it only when you undershoot, you will make up for it, but if you overshoot, you don't make up for it. And so perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on these and you know what the ultimate objective is of this new framework. And of course, some people argue, but changing the framework now, you weaken the inflation anchor because now people have to learn a new framework uh, in the middle of uh, thinking what's the inflation anchor. Perhaps you can um, elaborate right. on that. Right, yeah, now there's a um, um, lot of fruitful interactions, I think, potentially between uh, policymakers, um, analysts, and uh, the academic community, macroeconomists, uh, monetary economists on this, because, um, I mean, on flexible average inflation targeting, I, I will admit, you know, given my own uh, research background, I am certainly attracted to sort of the technical aspects of, you know, trying to be very clear about the uh, monetary policy reaction function so that, you know, everybody can look at it and know what the Fed is trying to do and where they stand relative to achieving their objectives. The, the challenge is nothing ever proceeds as nicely as in our models. I think the, our models give us a lot of good intuition. Um, I think more models help us because you see different insights from those models and things like that. On, more specifically on flexible average inflation targeting, I mean, I have to say that when the Federal Open Market Committee engaged in <clears throat> discussions about, you know, long run framework, do we need to make adjustments in how we're doing things? And, you know, we spent over a year, year and a half at least, talking about a number of the issues. And at one juncture, we talked about, well, you know, what about average inflation targeting? Flexible, you know, not so flexible. Um, there was the recognition that we had underrun our 2% inflation objective for some time. Although you could take the view that it was unlucky and things had intervened and maybe we had the right framework before. That was, you know, certainly on the table. As the committee members talked about it, we definitely included in the statement which is always vaguer than, you know, uh, spe uh, specification like this, you know, that we would seek to average 2% uh, inflation over time. And in a way that best assured us that inflation expectations would be aligned with our 2% objective. So you've got sort of those two features of average 2%. Yeah, you want to do that over time, not just, you know, um, but, but inflation expectations are an important part of that. Um, we then also said, look, because we've had this trouble with the effective lower bound and underrunning, if we find ourselves coming out of a period of undershooting for a while, we're willing to overshoot for a period of time in order to better anchor inflation expectations. And that's this averaging. So you put all that together. And I got to say, the committee did not have a taste for price level targeting. So if you thought about averaging inflation rolling five-year period over time, that's got elements of price level targeting in it. You know, if you overshoot, then roll into something where you need to undershoot to, to average that. So that's not what we intend. So it is asymmetric. It's asymmetric in the sense that it's after periods of underrunning that we need to think about this averaging to, to 2%. In general, we should be at 2%. Um, but I think, I think that's um, sort of important to, to recognize. So now suppose you're coming out of one of these periods like we've been where we're trying to recover from undershooting. Well, most of us had in mind, it's hard to get inflation up. You sort of push demand. You know, you try to get unemployment as low as possible in order to get inflation up until you're comfortable with where you are on that averaging process. And so it could take a period of time, many years to do that. What would be the time period? We left it vague. You know, we, we didn't you know, say that, but you know, you've got some idea in mind. And you hope that when you do that overshoot, you get inflation expectations to move up and be aligned. Now, what we're facing now is a supply shock. Now, if you've got that whatever period of time to average is five years, you very quickly average to two, because you've seen this increase in relative prices, if you think it's not permanent, if you think it's sort of transitory, you kind of see that it's gonna round trip or come back a little bit, but maybe you get out of your five-year averaging period. And so if you now kind of say, we've met this you know, part of the mandate and we've averaged it, I still worry that inflation expectations have not moved up and become aligned with 2%. 
And so we might back out of this too. So that's my concern. You can jump in on that. So you're yes, saying please. if the inflation is due to a supply shock, you don't really even count it in your average. Is then essentially, is this, do I hear this correctly or? I mean, you know, that's a fair inference from what I said. More generally, I would say what you need to do is appreciate whether or not that supply shock changed the expectations formation mechanism enough so that we started moving up. Maybe the wages started moving up in line with that. And then you would, you know, so you're kind of looking at the averaging and you're kind of looking at expectations and you're wondering if they, they've done the job for what you were facing. Um, is it asymmetric versus demand led and supply? Yeah, that is what I'm saying. Um, you know, is that, I think that's coherent. Other people might have a different view. It certainly allows discretion. I will grant you that, that, you know, do you see through this or, or do you not? So I think there's a lot to be discussed. Um, mm -hmm. But with this idea in mind, it's another reason to kind of go, let's be, let's be patient and let's see how the supply shocks uh, work their way out and whether or not expectations really move up. Because if we don't see expectations moving up sufficiently, the zero lower bound beckons before, you know, too, uh, too, too long is so, the concern. But just to clarify, there are two asymmetries. One is whether it's a supply or a demand shock. Yep. And then there's another asymmetry, which is, you know, I was in the past below 2%, hence I have to catch up. And, and when I was above 2%, I don't have to uh, correct subsequently. Is, do I understand this correctly? I do. No, that's right. That's right. And that and, and that's true. And I would just say that um, over an really entire economic cycle. The supply shock is bothering me because if I go in the 70s, it was all supply shocks. And you wouldn't then gank back, push it back like Volker did in order to get. Yeah. So I, you know, I remember work by um, um, Frankie Gertler and Watson and the Brookings um, looking back at the 70s where they came out as we had these supply shocks. And the reason why they kind of led to more persistent inflation is because monetary policy accommodated them too much. And if policy had not, the counterfactual is hard to do, but if they had not accommodated the supply shock, inflation would have come down more. I think the lesson that we've learned um, is more respect for the natural rate of unemployment, although I have said it hasn't led to inflation very much. But the other one is an inflation anchor. I mean, back then, you know, you didn't know what the anchor was, right? It wasn't 2%. You said price stability and it could be 6%. Uh, I think I remember something from uh, Herbert Simon in the mid seventies kind of going, well, you know, if inflation comes down and settles at 6%, well, maybe that's what, you know, the best that we can, we can do. Um, there were a lot of people who were, you know, uncomfortable with, you know, what was going on, but, but monetary policy is a big part. Now, I've just described how, you know, I would say, let's be patient and um, not declare victory on inflation. And it could be that there's actually more permanence there and that would lead to more um, inflation and that would be overly accommodative. Does that lead us to the 70s? I think it's, it's more like, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with two, two and a half percent inflation, but you get to three or three and a half and I go, no, 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 no. So, and we know how to deal with high inflation. We don't know how to deal with lower inflation very well because of the effect of lower bound. If I if I can figure out your reaction function, because you said earlier, it's all about, you know, expectations is about a reaction function of the Fed. What would it take for you to say, okay, now I'm worried. You would say if it hits 3% for a while, then, then I'm worried. Or, or is there any rule of so, thumb you can give the audience to say, oh, that's what, what it takes for me to really hike interest rates or do something. So my current assessment of the inflation you know, outlook is that um, I think the supply restraints are going to ease somewhat next year. It's going to be higher than we were expecting, but I think we're going to get down to like 2.1, 2.2% inflation by say 2023. And then it, you know, could go up 2.3, 2.4 with still accommodated monetary policy. Now, by the way, um, my, my assumption for monetary policy is got tapering coming on by the end of the year, even in January, it, it pretty much is, is, is done with the asset purchases uh, middle or fall of, of next year. And then, you know, rates begin to go up sometime in uh, 2023, but very gently. Um, and I've only got like, like one in 2023. Um, it's that path that's going to be important. In that environment, I still see underlying inflation as, as below 2%. And um, you know, not enough lift being done with wage ex 
growth expectations and the price. Now, if that's wrong, if we got up to two and a half, two and a half, 2.6, that type of thing, or three, that, you know, that would be an area where it's kind of like, okay, uh, we don't need accommodated monetary policy and we should, you know, gently, you know, try to uh, realign that to something that's more neutral, um, you know, and, and like that. But I will say that I have been, in, um, you know, my colleague, uh, Leah Melosi has worked with uh, uh, Bianchi and, and Rotner where because of the proximity, the effective lower bound, there's a downward bias on inflation. And so one way to address that with this asymmetric monetary policy where um, when inflation is above target, 2%, you, you know, are milder about fighting it because of the periods when you're below 2%, you're just very hard pressed to get inflation up. Um, and then you need to work really hard to get it up. That asymmetric monetary policy is more in line with how I think about it really. So let me move to the effective lower bound and because we talked about R star. So far, we didn't really capture R star and uh, we were got a lot of exciting stuff covered already. Of course, once you have, uh, you know, a more complicated inflation target scheme as we have now, it's more difficult to communicate and also perhaps to anchor it more difficulty. But for R star, can you give us your idea about R star? What is it? Is it something which is more slowly trending down or is it something which also moves over the business cycle? How would you, how do you capture this? And is it useful or is it more useful than just looking at potential output? Why is our star the magic number? Um, you know, and how do you estimate? And there's probably huge, there's huge disagreement how to estimate this R star. And how, how does it guide your thinking in how to conduct monetary policy? So I guess right. the main right. argument is that our star is getting closer to zero, hence there's less room away from the zero lower bound. That was what you said just right. now. Right. So, um, right. So, um, so Marcus, you have a very sophisticated audience here, you know, economists. Um, and yet, let me just, you know, sort of, sort of point out that um, I was also struck by a comment that. Um, some people made it at a recent conference. I attended the National Association for Business Economists uh, conference, and I've heard this kind of comment before, but it's like, you know, there are a lot of latent variables running around in our models. And it's like, you know, you put a star on something and it's latent, and, you know, how much confidence should I have in that? And it's kind of like, I wish I lived in a world where I got to see everything. You know, uh, one of the people was describing how learning by doing could be an important part of uh, productivity enhancements that we might see coming from people working remotely and all of that. And I kind of go, mm, learning by doing is kind of latent. I, you know, I can, I can come up with an estimate, but you know, when I have to estimate something, it's kind of like I'm trying to uh, deduce what it is. I mean, that's just part of what we do. So R star, um, you know, I have a very simple kind of view of what we're trying to do here, which is like, you know, we're adjusting interest rates. So if the federal funds rate is 3%, is that, is that accommodative or restrictive or neutral? I mean, back in 1992, the Federal Open Market Committee reduced the federal funds rate to as low as 3% and left it there for quite some time. And that was viewed as a combination that was gonna help get the economy back, uh, back up out of the recession and onto um, stronger growth. Um, you know, so in 2003, when the FOMC went to accommodation, we got down as low as 1%, and that was viewed about as low as we would be willing to go because of a variety of things related to financial markets and money market funds and things like that. But eventually in 2008, it was like, well, all, all speed ahead to zero, um, that type of thing. We, we always have to make a judgment as to, you know, what, what is accommodative, what's neutral? Is 3% 3, 3 right now would be viewed as very restrictive. And so it sort of depends on some equilibrium, real and nominal interest rate, which you know clears markets and you know seems consistent with um, the economy in neutral. Now I'm going to cheat because I do a lot of this sort of back of the envelope stuff, and that's, there's probably sort of a medium run R star, which might be associated with a particular model that you might like as it runs towards steady state growth, like the New Keynesian model, maybe when. Uh, price rigidities and you know wage rigidities are removed, um, but of course that's a medium-term concept, and in the moment it may not correspond to what neutral or accommodative would be. So there's sort of a short-term equilibrium funds rate as well, which could be lower than R star and whatnot. So 
we're always trying to make a judgment as to whether or not policy is accommodative. We're going to judge whether or not output is growing as fast as it can, uh, some measure of potential output. So all of those things we have to have an opinion on. We spend a lot of time you know, thinking about the structure of the economy and you know, labor economists and microeconomists helping us with industrial organization as to what the economy can do. And then labor markets, what a, a natural rate is, what matching function, efficiency, and bargaining could be um, in, in search and, and, and things like that. So, so we have to have views on that. And our star is just uh, one of those. I, I think of it as, um, you know, just how, just how much room. So if we started raising interest rates, you know, a couple of interest rate increases in 2023, and you kind of go, still very accommodative, right? I mean, a uh, funds rate that's half a percentage, one percentage point must be accommodative. And I kind of go, well, what's inflation doing? You know, if inflation is too low, then um, that's probably not the case. But it's 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 really difficult. Um, so, so you mentioned the zero lower bound. Let's just perhaps on a few seconds on. One could argue now you can go negative with the interest rate, and hence the zero lower bound is not such a big constraining factor anymore because we have an effective lower bound, which might be minus one or minus two percent. Of course, in the US, you have the money market funds, which make the whole situation more complicated. Uh, do you see, I mean, just spending, given that it's not the most urgent issue at the moment, but do you see the US Fed considering going negative in the next crisis? Or do you think that's very unlikely and hence we, it, we are much more constrained and hence we have to consider alternative measures? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, is, is a matter of, um, you know, economic theory and, you know, what you can do uh, in a model when people uh, behave according to the rules, you can definitely, you know, um, impose some type of negative interest rate and kind of keep track of the dysfunctionality in certain markets that might come about from that. But, but yeah, that, that could be um, accommodated for sure. And we have seen the experience of uh, the ECB, the Bank of Japan and others um, who have pursued that. Now, you got to say that back in uh, 2008, I think that if you calculated uh, what the um, uh, some measure of optimal or best federal funds rate you know would be at that point it would have been about minus four um, percent I know nobody who is willing to contemplate minus four um, percent if, if we agree that people have gotten up as high as minus three quarters of a percent but it should have been lower there's still work to do on another part of that so I think that's so I think that's hard. I also worry that um, the next cycle, I think financial markets are gonna be very clever at trying to devise defenses against those negative rates because when you talk to bankers, they do not like them at all. I mean, they, um, um, you know, that's almost uh, tyranny, I think. Um, and, and so I think you have to take the reality that um, um, they're very unpopular political economy probably matters in some cases. And we've got these other methods like asset purchases and frankly, just communicating that we're gonna keep doing this until we get to our objectives. Um, that seems to be um, a, a big part of that, but. Um, so given that we're running, it's very interesting, So, but we're running a little bit late on all the topics we still want to cover. I would like to raise also a little bit, you know, when the alternatives to cutting interest rate is more forward guidance, more QE, and to some extent, what the FOMC thinks is given by the dots. Uh, perhaps you can elaborate. How do you find do you find the dots very useful, or do you find them more confusing, or do you think it's a useful way of doing some hidden forward guidance in a sense? And when we do, you know, should it be the forward guidance more state contingent date? contingent, what's your thinking along that dimension? Um, right, well, I mean, I think you're probably speaking to the biggest proponent of the dot chart among all of my colleagues, current and former um, mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Um, I don't know, I view it as just a simple uh, matter um, the way I've described it before, I could probably you know, so you know so it um, you know we've got uh, seventeen uh, um, eighteen uh, participants um, who submit um, um, projections and we you know, summarize those 
And it would be much too easy at various times to kind of say, I've said this in public before, back uh, my good colleague, uh, Charlie Plosser from the Philadelphia Fed, who um, is well known to everybody in this audience, a former editor of the uh, Journal of Monetary mm -hmm. Economy and relatively uh, staunch uh, inflation the hawk. Um, and so it, it would not be difficult for Charlie Plosser and myself to submit basically the same economic projections mm -hmm. of inflation getting to our objective, uh, unemployment getting to its natural rate output, you know, on track. And you might say, well, you guys agree. But in fact, we had serious disagreements because I would be requiring a tremendous amount of policy accommodation to get that inflation objective up to 2%. And I think uh, Charlie Plosser thinks that he would, uh, you know, the, the idea would be, you know, you need a lot of, you know, movement to neutral or restrictive in order to keep it from going well above that. If you don't see what the policy reaction function, it's, it's just incoherent um, to compare these, these numbers. And so the dot chart, I know people get exercised when they see a big spread in, in people's projections for the funds rate a few years out. I got to say, that's the best indicator of whether or not there was a open and honest uh, conversation at the FOMC, um, that there were disagreements that were uh, discussed at some length, um, or whether or not it was just a mild, everybody, you know, thought the same. And um, you know, so, so I think it, I think there's a tremendous amount of information there. It causes... Um, unpleasantness for some people who are trying to, um, you know, spin a story or understand what everybody's doing. On the other hand, I think it offers opportunities for people to ask us uh, more about that, like you are. Good. So it's, it's good to know. I mean, it's also, but you would say, if I read you correctly, that the disagreement is, is the most informative part, or is one informative part of, of the dots. Um, let me move. I would like to cover three more topics and everything uh, be a very little time. Let me just summarize the, the three topics. One would be, uh, the next topic would be interest on reserves. Now, in, we changed the policy or you changed the policy paying interest on reserves, but so far it was not a big issue because the policy rate is, is close to zero. How do you think will the fact that now we pay interest on reserves affect the whole monetary transmission mechanism? Because we have a different framework now compared to what we had, you know, before 2008. When the, do you think it's, it's a oh. radical change? And has implications on it, the optimal size of the balance sheet, of course, and, and I everything think, I think. we should do within a minute or two. So. <laughs> yes, I get, I get you. So I, I, think it is, I think it is a big change because um, We've really been able to um, expand our balance sheet, uh, knowing that it's difficult to get our balance sheet back down to a point where if the only way we could uh, tighten monetary policy was through a market for the federal funds rate, it would be difficult to make reserves scarce so quickly. So uh, by doing this, we've been able to increase the interest on reserves um, and other short term uh, money market rates uh, would go up and then price, uh, credit would be priced. Uh, in line with that. So we've been able to maintain a large balance sheet because of this. Um, it does seem to have changed banks' um, incentives, right? And this was originally viewed with the proposal as like, well, there's this inefficiency where they're, they're not earning interest on reserves and they should. So isn't that a good thing? Well, it turns out that um, a lot of bankers are kind of going, I got too many reserves and um, I don't um, need to lend out as much because you know the people I who demand loans are getting everything that they need so reserves are who would have thought that deposits could be too big um, now if it, it now if the interest rate were higher they wouldn't mind that so much and so it does inject a choice for them as to lend out and accept the credit risk that goes with that um, but that's kind of what we want in order to get the economy going so there are a whole bunch of issues and essentially reserves is, is a form of government debt. So it becomes very close to a form of government debt. So this way. Um, so the next thing perhaps you can touch upon uh, um, the international implication of this new monetary framework, the flexible average infl inflation targeting. So it, it's a little bit, if I may say so, 
you know, now there's an asymmetric element in the target. The ECB was always criticized for having a target just below 2% as being asymmetric. And, but now the US has essentially an asymmetric target. But what do you think, what's the international for the global international monetary system? What are the implications if not all central banks have the same straight inflation targeting framework? Where you know the Fed is a particular framework, ECB is a different framework. Perhaps the Bank of Japan is. Do you think it has implications for the foreign exchange markets, and uh, it will play out in different ways uh, because interest rates might move differently, hence exchange rate might move more dramatically. Um, I, you know, I, I would, I would, I would take the point that you know different monetary policy strategies will lead to um, you know different relative valuations of uh, a country's currency. So I would you know sort of expect, expect that foreign exchange rates could be affected by that. It, you know why is it that much different than say you know the 70s when you know exchange rates floated and you know had you had like you know the Bundesbank, which was much more conservative um, and you know the US and the UK, which was having trouble getting uh, inflation down and you know you would, see expectations of exchange rate movement somewhat, you know, in line with that or not in line with that, right? I mean, there's actually quite a, and I don't do international finance, but there's quite a literature on, you know, what are the determinants of uh, exchange rate movements? Uh, the details of how you implement policy would be important, um, but probably the longer term commitment to a particular inflation goal uh, would have a lot to do with that. And if you really didn't display commitment to that, then you can imagine breaks in. Those kinds of, of I'm, but I'm just thinking academically, you know, of, about this. Um, it's just sort of business as usual. I think that uh, if one bank pursues one type of, uh, one country pursues one type of policy and another totally different, that you would, you know, see some uh, pressures for repricing. So you mentioned initially early on in our conversation that you know one was the theories, the fiscal theory of the price level. And in that theory, you know, there's fiscal and monetary dominance uh, playing. So depending whether the fiscal side is in the driver's seat or the central bank is in the driver's seat uh, determining interest at the inflation rate. Now we have also financial dominance, uh, a term, you know, I, I played around with, uh, but you know, the, the government debt level or generally the debt level is very high, you know, in the private sector, but also in the government sector. And then we have all the debt ceilings aspects is there some any uneasiness this might actually translate into some uh, problems and you know if the debt ceiling do you think the fed should then intervene and uh, stabilize the situation or what what's your thinking on that on on the fiscal versus monetary dominance uh, in particular in the light of you know appointments and all this it might make the whole interaction between fiscal and monetary authorities more complicated and uh, harder to predict in a sense Right. So, I mean, I, you know, the debt ceiling is sort of a construct of uh, Congress with the president, I suppose. And so, you know, they've already passed legislation, which is authorized spending. And now the question is whether or not they can write checks to, you know, fulfill that spending. But uh, it has been authorized and that's what's taking place. So, I mean, I, you know, Congress, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Governor Brainerd the other day, you know, Congress knows what it needs to do. And, you know, I think they're, they're, they're working through that. Now, the Fed is obviously going to be paying attention to market developments as we, you know, always do. Um, but, you know, and, and making sure we understand, um, um, you know, the implications um, you know, for, for those things. Um, I, I think that, you know, beyond that, the, the longer term issues, obviously, um, if there were with a lot of debt, it's not if there's a lot of debt, there is a lot of debt, there will be more debt. The question is, what's the appetite of the market investors savers? You know, and at the moment, um, there's been, you know, a strong demand for safe assets. Uh, the U.S. continues to be, um, you know, providing safe assets um, at the moment. That could change. Um, there certainly could be a level of debt that's viewed as, uh, you know, less, you know, more nerve wracking, uh, if you will. And I, you know, it's, it is certainly the case that in an environment where interest rates are higher, and policy has been accommodated. You know, that's looking a little bit more like the 70s where it's kind of like, well, you know, you know that more restrictive policies could be necessary to rein in, you know, um, you know excess inflation, um, but you might be reluctant to do that. And then that feeds on itself and then you got to bring Paul Volcker in. So nobody wants to 
have to go through the pain of, um, you know, redoing a Paul Volcker kind of, um, you know, having to break the back of double digit inflation. But um, we're so far from that right now. Now, somebody probably said that back in the 60s, right? So, I mean, this is why everybody's nervous. I get that. Um, but, you know, sort of, you know, paying attention to this and, you know, the Fed is moving, you know, towards, um, you know, tapering before too long. And, you know, then it won't be, you know, there will come a time and we'll start raising rates and then we'll be seeing how inflation is and we can make that adjustment. We're a lot better at being able to deal with uh, inflation above 2%, bringing it down than we are inflation below 2% and getting it up. So, you know, I think these are the right kinds of questions to ask and uh, looking at the indicators that we are. And there are differences of opinion, obviously, and we need to be paying attention to that and, you know, trying to assess where uh, the best path is. Um, and there'll be disagreements and I'm, I'm, you know, I look forward to, to learning more. I think patience is required at the moment though. But it, it might be quite hurtful if you have to bring inflation down, especially if the debt level is very high and then the interest rate goes up and political pressure is coming uh, essentially towards, it will be, it's more pleasant, I guess, to be a central banker when the fiscal and monetary authority push in the same direction. Uh, it's probably less pleasant when yep. the push comes in the opposite direction. Yep. So I, I mean, would like is, to... is, 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 is there anybody out there who's really thinking that, you know, um, when, you know, if the Fed were to let things get out of control, would we be looking at 3% inflation year after year after year? Um, you know, or three becomes four becomes eight or something. Um, you know, I, I, I think we all understand, um, you know, what the risks are and uh, the lessons from the 70s have been studied, absorbed. And if anything, you need to push back a little bit against that, I think, because of the effect of lower bound. But, um, you know, even though I, you know, kind of say we should be pushing for inflation above 2%, so we actually average it for those times when we're in recession and it's a lot lower. I mean, there are limits, of course. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think we're anywhere near that. Um, but we do have supply shocks. We got to pay attention to how permanent they are, how it works its way into wages and things like that. So, you know, I think the next uh, six months are going to be, you know, very, you know, uh, important to be monitoring all of the data and assessing whether or not that view is wrong, frankly. Very well. Thanks a lot. Let's typically we always end with one particular note. Traditionally, we ended with a positive note. You can end with a positive note or with a note on making the system more resilient or our society more resilient. If you have one positive thing, you say, I, this will, should be done uh, or this would be a nice thing to do. It might be even addressing the academic community saying the academic should study that because this is really important for policymakers uh, in order to make our society more resilient against future shocks or we might face. Well, I, you know, I, you know, I think that in, inflation is a very, um, you know, challenging uh, economic object to uh, study and assess and, you know, predict. And I think that, um, you know, many of us are comfortable sort of having an intuition about inflation. I'm going to put myself in that category. And the more that we can, you know, sort of fine tune our understanding and come up with some of these models, as you mentioned, if you lose the anchor and I think you get a nonlinear response, what is it? that kind of gets us at that. Um, those are big issues and uh, policymakers, I, I believe, my personal opinion is we've benefited tremendously from the academic involvement and the research and absorbing that. And uh, even if uh, policymakers don't always follow exactly the prescription of a uh, flexible average inflation target or policy rule tailor or something like that, it is uh, chastened uh, by that knowledge. So, um, so I'm, I'm optimistic. Very good. So thanks a lot. Uh... Uh, and thanks to all the audience thanks. for listening. I think we had an a interesting discussion. Thanks for, uh, for all the insights you gave us. And I hope to see you next week again. Next week is with uh, Biri Eichengreen talking about debt, an issue we just covered a little bit at the end, but he will go back in history and present also his uh, new book on debt. Thanks to everybody. Thank you very much, Marcus. To Charlie Evans, the president of the Chicago Fed. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.